Benjamin Ledford with the Argonaut newspaper at the University of Idaho. This week I published a column entitled, Is God Chauvinist? about the Bible's view on women. Many who might call themselves feminists take a very low opinion of the Bible and its attitude toward women, or what they believe to be its attitude toward women. However, before we attack the Bible, we should know what it says. We're separated both geographically, culturally, and chronologically from the people who wrote the Bible. And sadly, this distance often hides what I would call the Bible's very high view of women. In reality, the more we study the Bible and the intention of its authors, the more it becomes clear that many things which may seem oppressive to us were actually set in place to protect women at the time. To take one quick example, Strict regulations against marriage and divorce in the Old Testament are often seen by us as being a way to keep women in abusive relationships, when in reality, they were created in order to protect women from being abandoned by their husbands. At a time when losing a husband meant losing your only livelihood and committing to a life of poverty, this was an important protection, which not many women in the ancient world enjoyed. In the same way, when we look at the context of the New Testament, we see the high view of women. Ancient Greek society was one of the most oppressive and male-dominated of the era. Women were viewed as property, as intellectually and morally inferior to men. They could not, of course, hold office, vote, compete in athletic events. And wives were not even allowed to leave the house without their husband's permission. It is into that culture that the Apostle Paul writes that husbands and wives are joint heirs in Christ, and that a husband is to love his wife as he loves his own body. It seems the Apostle Paul was, if anything, a radical feminist. Naturally, some will object. They may say, well, you can make the Bible say anything you like. Well, it is true that the Bible is a big book, and if we're willing to take something out of context, we can find verses and twist them to say many things. But the more we study the Bible in its entirety, to understand the intentions of the authors, the more these alternative interpretations fall away. Another objection might be raised to say, but the Bible still advocates gender roles and submission of women. This is true as far as the Bible believes fundamentally that there are clear differences between men and women and that they have different tasks accordingly. And further, it gives the responsibility of headship and leadership to men. But this can be easily a cause of confusion because we associate leadership or headship with status and position. However, reading the Bible, it quickly becomes apparent that leadership is not associated with status, but is associated with service and sacrifice. It is a responsibility that men are being called to, not an honor. Finally, someone may say, no matter what you make the Bible out to say, isn't it true that Christians throughout history have oppressed women? This is true, very much so. But it is important to remember that Christians did not invent misogyny or the oppression of women. These things have been around long before the New Testament or the Old Testament and many places in the world. And it was, in fact, Western civilization influenced by biblical morality, which created the ideas of chivalry, of women's rights, and of equality. And it is very important to remember that although Christians may misuse the Bible, if anything, the message of Christianity is that we are sinners and fallible. It is not to us that people should look for their example, but to Christ, who called all people, both men and women, to him. As Paul says, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For the Argonaut, I'm Benjamin Ledford.